Last week, we talked about the present, that we can truly be in the present when we are in his presence. That when we are in his presence, that is when he really allows us to intentionally live our life, to be able to really understand the call that he has given us. Today's sermon title is Free from Our Past. So if you would have to rate your past from a one through 10, what rating would you give it? Family, let's, let's mentally think about it. Our career or studies. Our relationships. Your puberty season. What grades have you given yourself? How do you gauge your past? The reality is many of us are shackled by seasons in the past, by moments in the past. And if we really think about it, there are several moments in our past that we cannot let go. And it still to this day does not only affect today, but it causes us to not truly be able to live in the today. And my encouragement for us today is through the gospel and through relationship with God, how we can be set free from the shackles of the past. We're going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19. If you open your Bibles with me, but if you do not have your Bibles, we'll have the verse up on screen. We're going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 through 19, and we will just really go into the message. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I'm gonna read this first one more time because we have a short passage today. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Remember, now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The first thing that God calls us to do is to remember not former things nor consider the things of old. And actually, this comes on the heel of verse 16 and 17, where he says, remember what I've done for you. So what it it means by not remembering the former things is not that we are some sort of, uh, we have amnesia, right? I don't know if any of you guys watched uh, Memento. It was one of my favorite movies, right? It's about a guy who has a head trauma where he only can remember up to few minutes of his day, right? And so he has all these tattoos all over his body. It was one of the first films by Christopher Nolan, very artistic film. But it's not meaning that, right? It's, God is not calling us to completely forget the past. He's not calling us to uh, completely have, like, say that today is just a new day, yesterday I don't remember. That's not what God is saying. If in actuality, there are things that we do need to remember. Primarily, remembering what God has done in our life. That actually, when, when we remember our past, what we remember a lot of times is we could spend our time remembering God's faithfulness or we could remember the moments in our time that we genuinely feel in our heart that God has been faithless or that he has not intervened in our lives. And that paralyzes us because we become beholden to the past. Today, I want to encourage us to think about what it means to not hold on to our past regrets and glory, but to look at God's faithfulness. Today, I'm going to be talking about some marks of some of us that are enslaved to the past. For some of us, past trauma robs us of present joy. 
We have situations that happened in the past that cause us to not genuinely be able to enjoy and rejoice in the present. That no matter what happens, we have this caveat of, ah, but something's going to happen. Even if something is really good, we're like, ah, I don't deserve it, right? We have all these weird thoughts in our mind that allows us not to really have joy and happiness in the present because of a thing called past trauma. Past hurt relationships may paralyze our present relationships. You hear the term, people that come with baggage, right? And it's true. We never want to be labeled that, but everyone here, in some shape or form, come with baggage because we all had relationship, romantic or not, right? We all have had relationships, so we all come with certain ideas that we live by. We have certain types of people that we don't even come into close proximity with because of past hurt relationships. It paralyzes, for many of us, our present relationships, and it actually poisons our present relationships and relationships that should not, it's unfair to treat people in our life a certain way because of how people in our past have treated us. And yet, we see signs of this, we're past hurt relationships. It paralyzes our present ones. Past failures may make us live in present fear. Because of mistakes you've made in the past, you are afraid to do even things that you need to do in the present. Past regrets stop us from giving our best now. What that means is, we're so caught up in regret, we're so caught up in things that have happened, we can't give our best and be present now. But you know what the irony is? Our present giving of not our best will lead to future regret. Because the biggest, re- if you ask old, old people, right, you know, you see those little interviews and they interview like people in their 80s and 90s. Most of them, their answer is as simple as, I regret not giving my best. I regret not seizing that opportunity. I regret having fear when I should have had boldness. I regret not trusting. I regret not living. It also may look like this. Your past glories is your reason for future complacency. For some of us, our past and how good our past was, how blessed our past was, how good we were in the past stops us from living in the present. I think one of the hardest things to hear is to hear that we peaked in high school, right? That is one of the hardest things to hear, but those that actually think that they peaked in high school, they can only live in the past because they can't let go of the past glories and things that went so well for them and move forth to growing and living and striving in the present. Finally, the past for many of us, makes us give up on the present, just in general. We become jaded. Uh, We become skeptical. And we become hopeless. And if this is us, if any of these marks represents you and I, then today I want to exhort you and encourage you to say only Jesus Christ can set you free from the enslavement of the past. Amen, church? Can we step into this promise with faith of what we're going to be able to read? That only Jesus can set us free from what we need to be set free from, which is enslavement of the past. The second thing we see in this verse is, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. You see, how we view our lives now is shown by how we engage with the past. What I mean by that is how we view the past. And for Christians to be released from the past, what we need to first do is to believe that God had a reason 
for the life that we have lived. That there is an exact, good, and a reason that only he can fully understand, that he does understand, that we could start to be set free. Most of us are caught up in moments we cannot let go. And I want to say that the first step in really a, it, being set free from the past is accepting that our past was the way it should have been. And the only way we can do that, honestly speaking, is to believe that it had a reason. And, and some of us are sitting in this room and we're like, how about death? How about tragedy of things, that, of things that weren't deserved by people around me or even myself? How can we make sense of a death of a loved one? I can't tell you how to think, but I'll tell you how I think and how I've resolved it. So I'm a pastor that have, has listened to many stories, some of which are horrible, especially when it comes to when I, I was a youth pastor for a long time. And I remember especially stories of young girls trembling, um, asking to speak to me, and hearing their stories of abuse. How can I speak to such things? I'll hear stories of people, young people, and this is a lot of the trauma happens when we're young, of young students, age of 12 and 13, praying and fasting for a loved one. And that loved one passes away. What can I say to these people who can't make sense? Not of mistakes that we have made, because that's a whole nother layer that we have to let go but of past situations in our life that are unexplainable. If you have heard my story, my life is filled with uh, many different types of tragedy. And actually at the end of it, one thing that people say is, wow, like how do you still have joy in your life? And I think about when that joy started, and it started when I thought about death, I thought of a tragedy, I thought about hardship. And I realized that I am a broken person. And many times, I expect the best, but I do the worst. When I, when I just look at myself, that death, is a product of us deciding that we don't need God and that we're gonna be our own God. And again, this is coming like my process going through my faith and just understanding that from the first day of creation, God actually planned perfection for us. He wanted to pour out everything and actually death has come because of us because we chose to live our life our own way, because I chose to live my life on my own way. And I saw a correlation very deeply with me trying to be the Lord of my own life, trying to run my own life, trying to make my decisions my way, my how, and I realized in my life what ended happening was regret, was fear, was just mistakes upon mistakes upon mistakes upon mistakes. And I thought that, yes, if God is sovereign, why does he allow such brokenness in this world? That would be the first thought, but then I would think, the thing about God 
Because he does not want our bodies, he wants our hearts. He wants a relationship with us. And if God changes everything and shifts everything and makes, wipes everything clean, then we're nothing else but robots, forced to love God. And the only other choice God has when he's in the presence of sin and rebellion is to clean the slate and start new. That's the only option God has. And actually, the fact that he's allowing this world to be broken is a sign that he hasn't given up love, wanting a loving relationship with me. And when that hit me, that the brokenness in this world, right, that actually the only solution is being reconnected and regrafted with God. That that is the only way I'm released from the brokenness of my life. That epiphany, it helped me understand that God is not the cause of tragedy, brokenness, and despair in this world, but he is the only one that could set me free. Again, when I start looking at life with this perspective, I don't have to understand everything because my God does. Because my goal is not to control my life, to have my life a certain way, but my goal is to become in complete communion and connection with the God that is in control of everything good and, and perfect. And so I learned to accept what has happened in my life. And some, some of us, we need to accept the past, things that have happened. And actually, many of us are still in denial. And how do we know that you're in denial? In your mind, in your free time, in your sleeplessness, you are fighting against situations that has already happened with the what ifs. And that the first step of being set free from our past is accepting it and facing it. There was someone that called me this week telling me that they tried everything to run away from what's happening, but that God has set that person to sit and to mourn. Some of us need to mourn. That's one of the ways that we do accept. We need to accept that it was genuinely, it changed us. It made us waste so much of our time. It shifted and broke a lot of our relationships or situations in our life. We need to accept maybe by mourning, by hurting. But can you, this is something very interesting. Only by mourning and genuinely hurting can we actually many times understand not with our minds but with our hearts that we need God. Like, that genuine mourning, that genuine hurting is what draws us to God. And what actually allows us to not just think of the love of God as something that is mental, the gentleness and the grace of God that is just something we, woo, just goes over our head, but something that we can genuinely experience with our core. And that actually God calls us to mourn in reality what has happened and to come to him. And only then, when we accept instead of running away, we sit instead of distracting ourselves, can we release the past? And mind, uh, we have to think about this. It's not forgetting, right? The people that I've genuinely forgiven, I have not forgotten what they have done. Because that's stupidity. To put them in the situation, if, if there's someone that has betrayed me in the past, right? Forgiveness does not mean me giving them all my passwords to my accounts. That's not forgiveness. But what forgiveness looks like is when I am in a room with them, I am not sickened to my core. That I'm actually able, maybe it's going to take some time to, number one, I think this is very important, treat them like a human, right? 
Number two, accept the pain, but still try to love them like Christ. And number three, not decide to allow that person or that situation to control my life. Because you know what? When we can't forgive, you know what that is? I've said this before. It's like us taking a poison pill and expecting that person we hate or the person that offended us to be in pain when the only one that suffers is us. It takes a lot of effort to hate someone. It takes a lot of persistence to be bitter. And church, only by facing our hurt and facing our past and really allowing ourselves to process it, can we release it and allow that not to completely enslave our life. Some of us, we deal with uh, not such big things, but just ideas, right? Some of us, we can't let go of the fact that our parents are never pleased with us, right? Like, like and, and that's, especially if you're Korean, like this is, you know, we have multi-ethnic church, but especially if you're Korean, that's one thing most Koreans have a hard time overcoming. And this is like the first gen Korean uh, parents way of motivating their kids, right? Like, it's not because I'm not pleased with them. I want to in- encourage them and challenge them for excellence. But even something like that, unless you face it and you say, you know what, like, um, I'm bothered by this. A lot of my decisions I make is based on the fact that I can't please my parents. I have a chip on my shoulders. You know what? That's not healthy. Because number one, the most important thing, I cannot accept that God is pleased with me and he loves me without condition. If I can't let go of this thought or this belief or this shackle in my past that my parents are never pleased with me. You see, we need to face these roots in our life that are not of God. And when we face it, we can release it. And finally, we could build upon it. You see, my philosophy in life is there's always something to learn from our past. But the problem is that what we learn is through our paradigm and our way of thinking instead of what God has, how God has called us to think. Case in point, and, and I think this is really shown in the examples of when we serve him in the way we think in his name. So I remember in my early 20s, like, I was this man on fire, like, I'm still pretty passionate, right? I'm, I'm still passionate. But back then, I had like young man's disease. I thought I was invincible. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go to the ends of the earth. and I'm going to give my life for the gospel. It got to a point where I was very finite, right? I was a college student. I mean, I worked two jobs, but it wasn't very lucrative at all. And, and I, had a, I had a bunch of students. Like, I would, I would commute two hours to come up to do ministry. And I remember a lot of these guys, like these young guys, many single single parent uh, households. These young guys would just want to eat like breakfast burritos with me, Saturday morning, right? But it started with a group of like five guys and it was like, uh, you know, oh, five guys actually sounds good. But, you know, with five guys, but then eventually it became like 15, these young junior high guys that have unlimited appetite where I realized it's not efficient to take them to like a regular a la carte meal place because they'll buy some of them two, three, four burgers. It's better to take them to like a Korean barbecue, right? Which was like $9.99 back in the early 2000s, which is actually unthinkable now in the States. But it got to a point where I was like, you know what? Like I can't afford to buy all these kids students. So what I start doing, and this is from the fury of my passion, right? I was just like, I'm doing God good. Like I'm being so pure. So I start fasting during the week when I was at school to have extra budget to buy the students food, right? And so that sounds great until reality hits. When they graduated from junior high, one thing I asked them to promise me was, hey, like, be with good influence, you know? Like, at least, and I, 
I already knew that this was from a selfish motive. Show that the time I spent in you is meaningful, which isn't asking for much, right? All I'm asking is live a good life. Live a holy life. Don't get caught up with the wrong crowd. And I remember one year into this, they, they, they went to high school. You know high school, you know, guys, it's all about swag, right? It's about getting with the right crew, right? right being cool. Like, when you think, talk to high school boys, it's all about being cool. I don't know what the present word is. Like, I don't want them to say any present lingo because I will sound really outdated saying it the wrong way. So I'll just say it for my, my generation, being cool, right? And I remember I, I would go to the group of guys and, you know, like, this is the Korean Americans in the States. They'll be smoking in the back of the church. And, but they're, I'm a junior high teacher and they're in high school now. So I'll go to them and say, like, hey, like, how are you guys doing? And they would just give me the cold shoulder. I'm like, hey, like, how are you guys doing? Uh, whatever. Hey, like, you guys don't seem like you're doing too well. And they say, I remember one guy, this, I still remember to this day, he's like, mind your effing home business. <laughs> and the cough is real. I almost like punched him in the face. It's like, give me back all the time. You know? And that's when I realized that first year, you know what I, what I said? I said, God, I honored you. I gave my best for you. But look what happened. You know what, God? I can't do it. I will still love people, but I will not allow my heart to be open to receive their love. So there was a pre- phase of four years where it was called the reign of Joseph Pierre. If you know the French Revolution, like it was a very dark time where I said, I am not going to allow any student to even like me at all. I will love them with the principles of the word. I'll be harsh when they're doing wrong. I'll call out what wrong they're doing, and I will step back and just be righteous. And that was from like 23 to 27. And at the, when I became 27, God hit me, and he rocked my world. St. Joe, how in the world can you even begin to want to love someone when you are only exhibiting your version of love? The way you view your past is your way. You say you do it for my name? No, you, you do it for your name because you want to do something with your life. You want to leave a legacy. You want to make an impact on people. You want them, you want, you want to have some value in what you, influence you have given. Joe, you are thinking completely incorrectly. You need to accept my call for you in love, which means you need to be okay with being hurt. I know you've been hurt, and I'm going to call you to still love them the way you loved them before, because that is my definition of love. If you look at your life, if, you look at my, if I look at my life, we build upon the past. And either you build on your understanding of what is fair, what is good, what is bad, what should be, what shouldn't be, and we are going through just this complete jadedness for many of us. If you've lived life a long time, or you lived through much, or you can choose the path of someone in Christ, where yes, we build upon the past, but we allow God to determine what our past means. You see, he responds to behold, I am doing a new thing and it springs forth right with this phrase of do you not perceive it? That actually the question then some of, I would ask you is like, or you might ask me, doesn't everyone wanna let go of the past? 
But why do some people let go of the past and why can some people not? And I will say the answer is right here. Do you not perceive it? It is about perspective. It is about faith in knowing for the person that lets go of the past that God has a reason for it. And actually putting faith in God being in control of your life actually affects your present. Case in point, yesterday I was driving to church. I was driving to church and you know, I was, I was stopped and the car rear-ended me, right? And, that, and this is coming off the heels of me hitting two cars, right? So I mean, you know, in, in fairness, like, I'm not one to judge. But the thing is, like, I was just meditating on this message, and I, if I just thought in fleshly ways, I just thought about all the people that came out of their car, like, oh, right? That's the thing in Korea, right? Like, like I remember the last car I hit, I was going, like, three, four kilometers uh, uh, an hour, like, I, I just drifted into the car. And then the whole family came out like this, and I was like, are you serious? And the first thought that came to my mind is, oh, like, the fleshly thought is, you know what? Like, what goes around comes around, right? That's a human thought. And then, but then, like, I just said, but you know what? Like, God, like, it doesn't matter what people did to me. You were calling me to adhere to what you have, your standards, and I said, I'm not going to, like, react. So the woman came out, and she had a girl in the back, and she was like, I'm so sorry. And I said, you know, like, it happens. Let's just call the insurance company, just take care of it. But I tried to be kind. And when the uh, adjuster came and said, are you hurt anywhere? I was like, you know, I'll just be completely honest. Like, I know I got hit in the back. I don't feel anything, but if, if I do, I will, I will be very honest, right? Like, I don't want to pretend like nothing's wrong. But at the same time, I don't want to pretend like something's wrong. And he laughed. I said, wow. Like, maybe it's because you can't, you know, you're not Korean, right? Uh, because I spoke very broken Korean. As you know, my Korean's not that good. But you see someone with the perspective of giving their life to Christ. Whatever that happened to us in the past, that doesn't formulate our present and our present decisions. Actually, we make these, these decisions based on the faith that God's way is the best way. And the reason why many of us cannot perceive it is because our perspective has become stale and lifeless. That what was originally wonder, you know, Matthias is right there and he's, he's only like a year and change. Everything for him is new and wonderful. And I know you remember a time where things were fresh, new, and, and you were in wonderment, but now we've entered a phase of our life called young adult, adult, more older adult, and we've now become adults. But if you see in the Bible, Jesus never calls us to be adults of God. He has always called us to be children of God. But the reality is we kind of strut around God like we're adults. Like, okay, Jesus, I'm here. I'm at church. Look at me. Aren't you proud of me? I'm going to co-labor with you, Jesus. Let's do this together. I'm going to give you my resources. I'm going to give you my time. Jesus, aren't you proud of me? I've grown so much. And we strut around God like adults, which means we want to be treated as such in the presence of God. And what happens there is we cannot take his guidance. We cannot take his leadership. And the reason why some of us cannot let go of our past, because it's our past, and we should know better because we're now adults. The people that let go of their past, there's one simple thing that happens. They truly, fully accept that they need Christ. That we need saving, we need restoration, we need his renewal, we need what he believes to become what we believe. We stop fighting from the standpoint of our belief needs to be fulfilled or our belief needs to be, like, that's what we need to fill. 
Rather, that's the reason why we are the way we are. Again, let's think about when we were kids. Race didn't matter, right? Well, at a certain age, you did not look at how different you guys were. When you go to the sandlot, or maybe I'm aging myself, right? When you're going to the playground, your friends are your friends. You have the same interest, then you play with them. And then what happens? The people start telling you stuff. They start putting you in a certain category. They start comparing you to your friends. And I remember, I used to have a lot of friends, and I'm so blessed, at church especially, my parents never compare me to other kids, but that's a very Korean parent thing. They always compare what you're worst at with what your friends are best at, right, to motivate you. And I'm very blessed that my parents never compare me to other kids. But the reality of a lot of, like, especially, like, I had a, uh, I had a family member uh, whose dad would say, like, hey, like, why aren't you in shape like your cousin? And back then, I was in shape, right? And so it was like one of those things where he was always, like, he would not want to come to my house because that's what his dad would say. And what am I going to do in that situation? I can't do anything. So he started having disagreement and bitterness towards me. But that's what happens as we grow up, like, and we try to figure life on our own. How do we let go of the past? He calls us to have a childlike heart to say, I can't release this thing that's been bugging me all this time. Only you can do it. And I want to read for us verse 1, verse 2, and verse 14 from this chapter to show you God's heart for us and why he calls us to release ourselves from our past. God says to us, I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God. For your sake I send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives. How can we go back to the calling of wonderment and heart of a child? Number one, we have to say, God, I need to accept I don't know everything and I need to be okay with it. Instead of trying to figure out the parts of my past that uh, to make sense of it and why and be obsessed with it, I need to let go and allow your timing for you to show me why my life was the way or is the way it is. Two, I need to accept, God, that I'm not in control. I'm not in control of this world. Yes, I need to be faithful in my life, but I'm not in full control of my life. If anything, the more I try to grasp, the more it falls out of control. Third, God, I need you. Because I don't know everything, because the more I try to hold on to something, it slips out of my hand, I admit how much I need you. God, I trust you. This life that I want to live, I've tried living my way, and it's not worked. God, I trust you with my life, and finally, God, lead me. I'm not going to always understand, and bad habits will come up, or I will try to still do it my way, but I trust in everything that happens, that happened in the past, that happens today, that happens tomorrow, that you have a reason, and that you are the one guiding me. And when you have this heart of a child, as we once had with our parents, he will set you free from your past. And he will spring you forth to now. And you will be able to perceive what the last part of this passageway is. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. A deep truth is shown by this passage. This life that we live is a wilderness. This world that we live is a desert. It is not what some of us think, something where we just sit back in our seat and everyone gives us what we want is actually contrary and the complete opposite. And the one that will not only help us crawl through, but help, help us thrive through the life that we are called to live is God alone. I value, and I will finish this message with this application using the term wilderness and desert, way and river. 
The way in the wilderness means guidance in an unsure path, protection from future enemies and weather. And the oasis in the desert is refreshing, healing, and sustenance. So I pray that, what we will, that the prayer that we have today will be that God will guide us, he will protect us, he will renew us, he will heal us, and finally that he will sustain us. And that that will be a step of us saying, God, I'm moving forward from my past into the future that you want to give me in my life. Can we close our eyes and pray? You know, some of us, I don't know where you are in, um, in how you deal with your past. For some of us, we haven't even begun to accept our past, right? We're still in denial. And maybe that's what we need to uh, resolve in the heart. Whereas for some of us, we've accepted it our way, with our paradigm. And that's why we can't accept it. That's irony, right? That truly to accept it, uh, we have to think with his perspective. We need to release it. And some of us are in the process of building upon our past. But like me, we're in a phase of, we've said it, we've done it in his name. We've done everything in his grace. But actually, if we look at deep inside, it's been for us and for our glory, for our kingdom, and why God is uh, revealing it continually in our hearts. I don't know where you're at, but the ones that perceive it, perceive what the past was and what the present should be and what the future can be are those whose perspective is of God and not just of themselves. And that's the journey I pray that in this moment for these next few minutes you will really embark on together.